We're here with Ed Begley Jr. And we are talking about so much, but a lot of what we're talking about is being present, being mindful, and making these turnarounds in our life. We're talking about your bottom when you were drinking and using drugs, thinking this is my answer. I, I blend in better. I feel better when I'm, I feel like I can be with people because they're drinking as well. There's I'm funnier when I'm drunk. Fu- <laughs> All By the that. way, not true, is it? Not not at all true. Not, not at all true. true. Yeah, the more mindful you are, the more funny you can be. That's the irony is a lot of artists think they need to drink themselves, you know, to death many times, but you need the drugs and stuff like that. So tell us, what was that time you went, I've had enough, I'm done? I called up the doctor and the, my regular doctor was not available because I wanted some Valium to once again just <clears throat> sand the rough edge off the DTs in this horrible hangover <clears throat> so I could get through the night and get a little bit of sleep. And uh, my regular doctor was not in, so this on-call doctor said, well, I don't know about Valium. I think what you need is Thorazine, from what you're telling me. And Thorazine does not mix well with alcohol. Maybe you misheard me. I'm not sure. But I took a Thorazine. It was nothing like a Valium. It didn't do the same thing at all. Valium is a muscle relaxant. I took another Thorazine and another and another. I wound up taking about nine of them. Not as a suicide attempt. I had half a bottle left. I would have taken them all if I wanted to take my life. I did not. And finally, I'm awoken by my wife at the time, Ingrid, a wonderful lady. She slapped me around, but not for the usual reason. She's saying, wake up, wake up. Your color's bad. Your breathing's bad. You got to wake up. You got to move around. Cindy Williams is here. Your friend Cindy is here. We're going to take you to the hospital. They got me to the hospital in time, gave me an IV of something, an Epicac that I swallowed that came up with as much of the medicine as they could come up with that I'd already started to ingest. And I made it. I somehow made it through. I didn't do what I was telling my body to do, which is to shut down. Was it the end? It was the was, end. Was, it was, the was, end was, if I had gotten there five minutes. But was that your bottom that you didn't have a drink since? No, actually. Yeah, that's I, what I wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. No, that was my bottom. But then a year and a month later, I decided I'd start drinking in the garage again. And I drank half a bottle, not half a case, but half a bottle of wine. And I was sick as a dog, Craig. Mm. And I went, okay, I've, I've developed an allergy to tannins, I thought. I literally thought <laughs> I wouldn't like this before, but maybe I developed an allergy to tannins. The things we tell ourselves so that we can continue down that pathway. I thought somebody had poisoned the wine. I literally looked for a hypodermic <laughs> needle mark in the cork. I swear to God, Craig, I looked for a hypo needle <laughs> mark in the cork to see if someone was trying to kill me by injecting toxins. So I brought another brand of wine, tried it again, sick as a dog again. I went, okay, it's the tannins. I'll start with beer. I had three or four beers, sick as a dog, and I realized that I couldn't drink any amount of liquor anymore. All of it was like battery acid to me. All of it just made me toxic. Yeah. And my wife from across the the house, I was walking in the front door to get to the shower to shower off the smell of beer and wine off my body and my face. And she dropped a plate of fruit. She said, oh my God, you're drinking again. You're drinking again. Why are you drinking again? I said, why would you say that? I'm not drinking. She said, you are, now you're lying. I said, okay, I'm drinking, but how did you know it from across the room? I know you couldn't smell me. She said, your face changes. You don't know that? What do you mean my face changes? When you drink now, it's been that way for a couple of years. Your face, what do you mean my face changes? She said, you look like that, like that guy that's trying to get the keys from the dog in the burning jail. <laughs> what? You no, know, he's chasing the wench around the town square. You mean Pirates of the Caribbean? She said, yeah, you look like one of those guys. I looked in the mirror. I looked exactly like a Pirates of the Caribbean character. Exactly. A pale version. Yeah, at this point, I'm 30 years old, but I look like Roy Disney. <laughs> and so I went to a meeting, and I got sober, and I've been sober ever since. Wow, that's awesome. But, but the irony of the full circle thing is that your wife that you're married to now, Rochelle, turned to me back in the late 80s. I said, hey, can I get you girls a drink? And they said, we don't drink. I said, you're on solids? <laughs> so so um, that led me to her and her friend Carolyn taking me to my first. Isn't that great? And uh, I, don't, I can't say I stayed sober. I, I, I went out again, but it was only in the, within six months. And from that point forward, haven't had a drink, anything from the neck up, you know, except, you. except for – resentments and anger and things like that. That's still there. <laughs> but it really does help you deal with when you're deprogramming your thoughts. Like you had a program thought, for instance, when you would see drinkers, like uh, those great actors like Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole and Oliver Reed. You, oh, yeah. you had a thought programmed in you. That that's the way I want to live. Those people, have, they have everything that I want, right? I, I thought I would be a better actor if I was drunk. I literally thought that's a key to acting. Look at yeah. O'Toole. Look at Oliver Reed. 
Look at Burton. Look at all of them. All those British actors. Anthony Hopkins years ago. He's long sober now, of course. Right. <clears throat> but all of them were drunk as skunks in all these different movies and plays I was seeing. So that's the key. That's how I'm going to get to be a big actor <laughs> and, a, and a talented actor and a well-crafted actor. Not by studying and working the way they did at the Royal Academy, uh, you know, by drinking. That's the key to it all. And I thought yeah. I'd, I'd drink my way into an acting career. That didn't quite work out well. What, uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is my <clears throat> favorite year. Do you remember that movie? Peter O'Toole, yeah. great movie. Yes, I, 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 I used to do an impression. Oh, Stone, take me to that place you call Brooklyn, and we'll dine with Rookie Kai Roka. <laughs> <laughs> very I, good. I, very good. I just, uh, well, I, I love those guys too. James Mason was another favorite, and I mean, these were people, the heavy drinkers, and they hung out, and they were like a, a camaraderie, you know, fraternity. But when you break something down, which they did in that movie, you got to see the sensitive, the real side of him. Right which they wrote into the script, you got to see it. It's not all that. No, it's not. It's, it's not all that. It's rough mornings. He, he, a lot of rough mornings and a lot of rough relationships. Lot. And, and not, you know, what I, you know, I'm not here to take someone else's inventory, but I can say that you and me used to idolize people like that. And now, do you have people that you look up to now? Like who are some of your... Uh, you're heroes. I mean, people, you can be a hero to people, especially after your book and people read your book and you can be a hero to people and you can be at least a mentor or a guide or a, a Sherpa taking people out of their misery and their conditioning, their programming that think that this is my answer. Do you have anybody that's your kind of Sherpa, your, your shift Sherpa in your Tony life? Tony is Tony. Anthony Hopkins is a, a friend of mine and a great source of inspiration. Yeah. But I got to talk about a guy. I'm thinking about this right as I sit here. I'm very grateful to my friend Bruno Kirby for helping me when I was struggling with alcohol, my first uh -huh. wife, and all the people I've mentioned, and Cindy Williams taking me to the hospital. But it's the people who were over me, who were fed up with me, <laughs> that really helped me in immeasurable ways. And there's wow. this guy, Billy Boyle. This guy used to be able to smoke at meetings back then. He'd be smoking a cigarette, thin little mustache, five foot six maybe, thin, skinny little guy. I came in the meetings. Now this is about the fourth or fifth time I've come in with something new bandage, walking into meetings says, Hey Slim, how many times is this now you've been to, in and out these doors? I said, I don't know. You tell me, Billy. He says four or five times. You know what? You're never going to get sober. Wow. I said, what a terrible thing to say. Why would you say that? I said, cause it's true. Aren't you married? I said, yeah, I'm married. You got two kids. I said, yeah, you got a little place in Hancock park. I said, yeah, you got a job. I said, yeah, I do. He said, Oh, you're screwed. <laughs> so why, that doesn't sound like uh, screwed to me. It sounds pretty good. He said, no, here's the problem. You haven't lost anything yet, and you're going to lose all that and more. Yeah. Here's what's going to happen next. Before you take another drink, you're going to call me before you drink, and I'm going to come there and kick your ass. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, sure, Billy. Uh, you're going to kick my ass unless I call you before I drink. You don't forget that. So sure enough, a few months later, I'm there at LAX. They're opening up the bar at LAX at 8 in the morning. I'm about to get in a plane to go do a movie. I'm going to drink in first class in the way. But since they've opened the bar, I'm going to have a Bloody Mary. Before I even get on the plane, I put it up to my lips, and I remember Billy Boyle. No oh. cell phones since 1978, so I put the drink back down yeah. over the payphone. Billy, who the hell is calling me at this hour? It said Begley, but LAX, and I'm about to drink. Where are you headed? Okay, I didn't expect that kind of a casual response geography and what have you said, I'm going to Cuernavaca. He said, Oh, I hear it's really nice this time of year. Oh, he yawns a bit. Give me a call when you get there. I said, Billy, no, maybe you don't understand. Bartender, did I just order a drink? He's not far away. He said, yeah, you're going to come drink. I said, yeah, Billy, I ordered a drink. I'm going to drink it when I hang up with you. He said, no, you're not going to drink, but you give me a call when you get there, buddy. Oh, he yawns again. <laughs> Billy, I'm going to drink on the plane. I'm going to drink right now. Okay. He said, you're not going to drink. I said, I'm going to drink. He said, no, you're not. You know why? I said, no. He says, because you call me. Mm. And I realized he was right. He said, if you wanted to drink, you would have had that drink before you called me. Wow. If you didn't want to, if you wanted to drink, you would have come in that first meeting. I saw you come in beaten and bruised. You don't want to drink. Now try to remember that and call me when you get to Cuernavaca. And he hung up on me mm. and I didn't take that drink. Those kind of guys really helped me in immeasurable ways too. Yeah. The guys that were fed up with me and over me and gave me what I guess is called tough love. Challenging people is so we avoid conflict so much. And I, I keep saying the avoidance of pain is worse than the pain. We avoid those conflicts. Right. We avoid sharing with someone, reflecting back to them the damage that they're doing not only to themselves but to others by them being in this condition. And I'm dealing with it right now with a 
someone I love dearly, I won't say who it is, who is a full-blown drunk. And he just got a job that tells him, I'm not a drunk. Look at this job I have. Right. I'm this young, and I've got this executive job, and look at me now. And then he's now transferring this anger over to me, like, you know, I don't need you, I don't need you, and, and things like that. And it's so upsetting to me because I'm thinking – now he's just doing things out of spite. And, and, and when people have those jobs, you're now being applauded and lauded and people are saying, look at you, look at you, look at you. And it's the ego takes over. Once the ego takes over, we're done. But when the humility takes over, when you can say, I've had enough. And you let's listen to people like that who could be bold enough to say, no, I'm not going to collude with you and enable you and have a drink with you, which we're conditioned to do as well. Like that's how you bond. You can bond like that with your friend, Billy. Yeah. That's a bonding that's truly unique and beautiful and profound. If you read uh, Easy Riders and Raging Bulls, read that book or any, uh, be there at that time, which I was working in all these movies that I did. It was bad form to not get drunk with people. Yeah. To not do a couple of lines with people. It's right. like, what are you, a narc or something? A narc. Were, Remember the narc word? Yeah, people were afraid of you. If you wouldn't do coke with them, wouldn't smoke a joint with them, wouldn't drink with them, they were scared. I got more work being drunk, you know, with a lot of these people who were also drunks. And that, that's just the way it was back then. Yeah. So. It, well, it still is. Yeah. It abs- a, we, we think that it's, oh, the days of the martinis and the Manhattans and the things like No, it's just changed drinks. Right. But it doesn't mean that, that that still exists, that people want somebody that they don't want to be challenged on their alcoholism or their addiction. They don't want, so they don't want to be around you because they know that you have the truth. I think that's the greatest. One of the things I possess, which I enjoy, is I know what, where truth lies. You know what I mean? No pun intended, lies. Mm-hmm. But I know where truth is, and I think that some people are afraid of that. So this, this person who's saying, you know, I don't need you, know, you get out of my life and so forth, knows that I have witnessed this alcoholism to the, an nth degree and I've seen the damage and, and that person knows that this reflection is going to come back. I am not going to let up and ignore it. And that's what those people, those people that we drink with, they're ignoring that because they're ignoring it in themselves many times. Not to say everybody's an alcoholic, but a lot of times people, they go, it's misery loves company. They want that company to say, yes, look at, look at us. Look at this. Look how much fun we're having. I call them the woo people, you know, woo! Yeah. <laughs> like they're really, <laughs> <Yeehaw>. a, <laughs> you're right. The yeehaw woo people, they're really not having a good time. I've been there. Remember the, when you were a woo person, woo, look at us, uh, singing bar yeah, songs I, I and things. Like the devil. I wanted people who I knew used to drink and were now sober. I would try to get them drunk. I wanted them to join in my misery. I was literally wow. like some sort of sinister thing. Yeah. I don't what I got out of the deal maybe a drinking buddy, but was it worth it to somebody that was previously sober and is now drunk to get them drinking again? What was that about? Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that you, uh, yeah, you wanted to drink like a man. That's what we're, that's what that was defining was the defining drinks can define us, Definitely. but sobriety can also define us because we become a different person. What's the most important thing you've learned out of being sober you can share with us to just slow down. Oh, nice. To be in the now. And I've been there this whole talk with you. I've been in the moment. It's been wonderful, Craig. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's, it's, it, and to me, what's really weird. I talked about the woo people. You're having supposed fun. This is fun. To me, inspiration is fun. Creativity is fun. When you're creating, when you're inspired, when you're sharing, when you're uh, delivering these gifts that we have within us and not holding back. I think that's fun. We're not taught that. But that's just fun. Being present is fun when you're checking someone out. Like, I haven't seen you in years, but now we're in this present time in the now. It doesn't matter how many years passed. It doesn't doesn't matter matter how many times we're going to get together in the future. It doesn't matter. It matters at these moments. And I hope that people got things out of this, you know, which I'm sure they did. If they're looking at you and your true sense of self, which is amazing that you got there. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say is there's a there's an underrated movie that I saw years ago. I wonder if you can guess what it is. I'll give you a hint. It's a documentary. And boy, is that thing turned into a whole other uh, deal. After the, do you know what I'm talking about? No. Who, uh, who killed the electric oh, car? Oh, who killed the electric car? Yes, I have a small part in that. Oh, my God. That's a great. Chris Payne did a wonderful job. Talk about ahead of its time. 
Very much so. Like, we're now, like, a lot of the country is in electric cars. Yeah, they had the better mousetrap, GM did, and they didn't know what to do with it. They wanted to condemn with faint praise is what they basically did, like a line from Shakespeare. They just, they didn't promote it in any meaningful way. People didn't know where to buy it. You have a product you're trying to sell, not sell, but lease. They would not sell it one single car. They wanted to control it, so they leased them. And the, nobody that I ever polled, I'd ra raise your hand if you know where to get a, a, an EV1. Maybe one or two hands go up out of hundreds of people at a speech. Nobody knew where to get it. It's amazing, though. that So then it was killed. Right. But I was, it was corruption that killed it. Definitely. Yeah. And, and what was funny about the film is like, well, which corruption did kill it? <laughs> it could be a all. choice of, it could be a choice of uh, the motor company, you know, the, the, the vehicle companies, the gas companies. The, all of them. Yeah. All of them together. Right. And now uh, somehow, do you have any idea how it happened? And suddenly now it's more than accepted. It's actually encouraged. Do you know how that happened? Who was brave enough? Was it the elect the original electric car and documentaries like that? What What is it that broke us into that new realm of possibility? Watts per kilogram of batteries and the price of batteries plummeted, as did solar cells and things like that. All that stuff got a lot cheaper. So that helped a lot to have, you know, the, 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 the good thing about gasoline, if I can say there's a good thing, and there, there is, it's a fact, you can store, you know, 65 miles worth of power in a gallon of gas, which is eight pounds. Eight pounds of liquid is one gallon. So for one gallon, you can go 40 or 50 miles in many cars. So you can't do that with a battery with eight pounds of batteries. You can't go 40, 50 miles. But now finally, you can go 20 so odd miles with eight pounds of batteries or something like it. So you get a big pack together as Tesla and others have done. You could go 350 miles, which I've done in my car, 350. What kind of car are you driving these days? I have a Tesla. Do you really? And they go, the great thing about the Tesla is not just the batteries and the range, but the charging infrastructure. You can go the 5, the yeah. 10, the 15, the 70, the 80, the 90, the 395, little roads like that. And there's chargers all along and the way up to going to Reno, Nevada. There's, you know, Lone Pine and Mammoth and places. There's chargers, fast chargers, not like a slow charger that right. takes hours. I mean, 15, 20 minutes of getting a latte or something or mm -hmm. buying a newspaper. You sit in your car and read it and then get on to the next destination hundreds of miles away. This is why I say that people who are locked into things that can't happen is you live in that possibility and anything can happen. Right. When you live in impossibility and that can't happen, even a three-party system, you know, that used to exist, it, everything, oh, no, it's got to be this way, this way. How do we know? How do we know there's not evolution where you can have a third party which has a different perspective, a different take? That's what really bothers me about politics, too. It's like it's one way or the other way. And that's the, that's the division that I find to be the truth is that division is going to prevent anything from evolution taking place. Well, something's got to change, and I'm sure it will, and I hope it will be good. Yes. Oh, it will be good. Anyway, Ed, you're doing good. I love that you were here sharing your good and what you do. You back up what you're saying, which is awesome. I love that you're in a car now. Last time I saw you, you were on a bicycle. That's right. <laughs> Public transportation and a bike. I'm I've glad you're a long way. I'm glad you're off the buses, Ed. Thank you. Well, pal. congratulations on your book. Everybody get this book to the Temple of Tranquility and step on it. And you'll see what that title really means. You probably caught a lot of it today. But be in the now, be present, be with whoever you're with. In those moments, in those moments you can cherish. And remember, laugh your ass off. Take laughter seriously. And I'll see you next time on Still Standing Up. Thank you, Ed Begley Jr. And uh, thank you. Tell Rochelle thank you to my, conti my continued sobriety.